Hi, it's Alan Myers. I'm coming to you from Studio La Fabrique in saint Remy de provence where we just finished a week-long seminar for Mix with the Masters. We just spent actually six days with 15 professionals in their industry talking about mixing music for film. I have some questions here that people have sent in online that I'd like to answer for you. First question is from Anders Oliver. Do you delay spot mics so that the audio from them hit the main pair at the same time as the spot mics? If so, do you find that this helps the phase relationship between the spots and the main mics, or do you find yourself inverting the polarity on a lot of spot mics when mixing orchestras? Thanks for the question, Anders. This is an interesting question because it's something we talked about in the seminar this week. There were people here who have, were very experienced in orchestral recording, and I have some experience in orchestral recording, and there was a 50-50 split as to whether or not delaying the spot mics is really um, worth the, the effort to do. Um, I don't really delay the spot mics for a full orchestral recording. Um, I have this, whether it's, it's valid or not, this feeling that because in a full orchestral recording, the microphones are picking up instruments in front of them and behind them, that I'm actually blurring the arrival time of certain instruments that are in the room and being picked up by particular mics. Having said that, there are people that feel otherwise, and this is something I'm going to try on my next recording, where we'll use a clapper to establish um, uh, uh, you know, a spot, and I'm going to try using plug-in uh, time delay to line everything up and just see if it makes a difference. Having said that, what I do do is uh, when I am doing percussion overdubs, and especially with high transient stuff like snares, and, uh, and skins, I delay the spot mics for that to the room so that I get um, a very coherent attack. Because I find that when you have your spot mics 35, 40 feet away from your tree mics or your room mics, that you can sometimes get flaming on your attack. And for the high energy percussive stuff that I tend to do, um, we, we want to get it as sharp as possible. So I do do that. I do experiment with phase. I see, especially on low stuff like taikos and bass drums, which direction the phase should be in for, for the best effect. So yes, I do experiment with that. Yes, I delay uh, spot mics with percussion. No, I don't delay spot mics with a full orchestra. There you go. Sebastian Satizabal Victoria. Do you find yourself mixing with the score, especially on specific dynamic parts, or do you go by intuition and emotion? The answer is both. I do use the score when it's a certain complicated area, if there's certain parts I'm trying to pull out, and if it, there's, uh, the, the uh, time signatures are a little complicated where I need to really get in there and get out a spot mic, say for a woodwind part or a viola part, but I, I don't marry myself to the score because then I find I'm looking at the score, and, and the same thing when I'm recording, I tend not to spend too much time score reading when I'm recording because I really want to focus on what's going on in the room and focus on my composer, making sure that I'm making, making all the right decisions for him and that I'm really present in the session. I find sometimes when I start looking at the score, I get lost in the world of reading and I don't want to end up in that place. And the same thing when I mix. I want to be in the experience of mixing. I want to have that, that sort of mystical connection with the mix that sometimes when I'm in the score, it becomes too literal a thing. I'm just really sort of mixing by numbers and I want to avoid that. But um, there are times when it's just necessary. You know, if I need to push something up on the fourth, eighth note of a seven, eight bar, I need to know where that is and I need to be looking at that. All right, next question from Mike Ranch. Hi, Alan. What's your go-to hall in the Bricasties for orchestras? Do you use factory settings or did you create your own presets? Well, I hate to admit it, but my go-to hall is Register One, Program One. Uh, the, the main hall that uh, you get when you turn on the unit, to me, is just a fantastic sounding reverb. And what I do, the way I set up my reverbs, I use three Bricasties to do one surround reverb, where one Bricasti is the left right of the front, one Bricasti is the center of the front, and then one Bricasti is the left right of the surrounds. Um, and my main left, right, and center 
or Register One Program One Hall. Depending on the program material, I'll determine how much decay time I want and if I want a pre-delay. And then um, in the surround one, I use Hall and Deep just to get a little modulation. There's a little bit more modulation on that program and sometimes I'll use a little pre-delay on that. But that basic algorithm for me has been the most successful one. Uh, I do experiment. I do go in and I try other programs. I like Chicago Hall very much. Um, I like Clear Hall very much, but seven times out of 10, I'm gonna end up back on that first program uh, after I go through my experimentation. And uh, it's, it's, I, we were talking about that, how you know, a lot of times equipment companies put their best foot forward when you first turn it on. And I find that with certain plugins, certain reverbs, that the first thing that comes on when you turn on the unit or, or, or instigate the plugin is really their best thing they got going. And I tend to use that more often than not. Next question. Jorge Peno. Hi, Alan. Thank you very much for doing this. You're welcome. What are your main mics when recording orchestras these days? Ah, good question. Um, I, uh, in the last couple of years, adopted um, the microphones from this company, Flea, who builds mics in Slovakia. And they built me three uh, modern versions of the M50. I spent a lot of time experimenting with different mics, and uh, they really hit the nail on the head for me. They are wonderful mics, very clean, fantastic pickup pattern, uh, very clear. So I use them as my basic LCR on my Decca tree. And then on my wide left and right, I have uh, two mics that I've had for quite a while now. They're basically Dirk Brown of VM1s, but they've been modified by Klaus Heine, and they call them KHEs. So I use a KHE1 on my wide left and my wide right. Then for surrounds, I use Sennheiser MKH 800s on hypercardioid. Um, my other main mics that I use is uh, I, I do sort of in intermediary LCR in the room a little bit, and I use M49s for those. And then I also use an M49 as a brass overall. Um, other than that, the other mics vary depending on the project. Sometimes I go to a lot of ribbon mics for spots if I want a certain sort of tactile sound on things. And uh, with French horns, I tend to vary in between the Sennheiser MKH 800s and Shep's mics. Um, for woodwinds as overheads, I, uh, I do basic, my basic woodwind pickup is a stereo overhead, and I use Royer 122Vs for that. And then for my woodwind spots, uh, I'll use whatever small capsule condenser I have left at that point, which is usually the Sheps MK4s. Okay. Dieter van Holstein. Dear Alan, with the progress made in the summing engine in the latest version of Pro Tools, HD10 and on, do you still think that it is beneficial to use external summing when mixing? If so, how would you describe, in your opinion, what are the sonic improvements of summing out of the box? Great question, and uh, a question that is in the process of changing right now. Um, there's uh, been a move towards more in-the-box mixing. I've been exp experimenting with in-the-box mixing, and uh, I've been on a Euphonic System 5 for the last 10 years or more um, using their faders. At the reason I used external summing for the most part in the past is so that I had an intermediary gain stage so that um, my, my percussion buses and my, all of my buses that were very hot, uh, it, they had less to handle um, so that I had a little bit more headroom gain-wise between my different elements. And then I would, I'm printing these stems as separate um, stems and the final summing just will come on this stage with, when the dubbing mixer does it. Um, but Pro Tools has come a long way, um, and uh, I'm seriously considering starting to mix to a third separate Pro Tools rig and doing my summing through auxes in the box. I'm gonna be experimenting with that on the next couple of movies I do, and if that's the case, it might be time for us to rethink the whole console environment. Uh, with the System 6 coming out, 
with the touch screen and the uh, vastly improved Yukon um, uh, format, it might be time for me to take advantage of what in-the-box mixing gives me. And, uh, but I'm not sure yet. So the answer to this question is, I'm not quite sure at this moment. I'm sort of on the fence. Uh, a year ago, I was definitely uh, looking to use external summing. Um, but now things are changing and uh, more to be told later. <laughs> Zach DeVry asks, are your mixes for the film the same as the original soundtrack album mixes released for the movies? Is the album mastered at all? Obviously, it's in stereo. Also, can you speak on how your setup works with having multiple DAWs simultaneously? My mixes for the film aren't exactly the same as for the original soundtrack album. I start the soundtrack album based on the mixes of the film, but I've printed these mixes in stems. I have, you know, my basic elements separate, the low percussion, high percussion, solos, orchestra, so on and so forth. And then when I'm doing my soundtrack album, I turn off the screen and I start mixing from the stems so that I get the best musical experience as opposed to the best experience to be with picture. Um, and uh, I do, it's, it's sort of the last stage of, of what I do. Um, and uh, yes, I do master the album. I bring it to a mastering engineer. I work with a few really wonderful mastering engineers. I do a little pre-mastering on my own, but in the end, I let a mastering engineer take a last pass at it. Um, as for the, the multiple DAWs, um, now with Pro Tools having satellite, you can link together as many DAWs as you want, and uh, it makes life go really easy. Everything is completely synchronized, and you can solo across different machines. The way we tend to lay out our machines, we could, in the world of, of HDX, probably get most of the material onto one machine, but sometimes it's easier to have a separate rig that has all of the pre-recorded stuff, the synth elements that have been created by the composer. And then we have a rig that carries with it the orchestra, the solos, the percussion, all the live stuff that's been recorded for that cue. And that's good because that enables me to work on the synth tracks while the other tracks are being prepared by an assistant if it's a very large session. Then we have a third machine locked up. That is where I'm gonna print all of my stems uh, in the third machine that gets delivered to the stage. So I'm basically running three machines in a mix um, with the, the synth master again, the orc master, and the mix master. Next. Thiago Gobe Spada. Very Mew, do you use it only on percussion or anything else? Do you use it to compress the master bus? Manly massive passive, when and how? Okay, um, I love my Very Mew. I use it on the stereo bus. I don't use it on percussion. Um, uh, I definitely use it to compress the master bus in, a, in conjunction with my ear 825 mastering EQ. Uh, massive passives, I still use hardware massive passives. I use them on my, my string and brass buses, my orchestra buses as LCRs. I still love that sound. And uh, as much as I love plugins, and I do love plugins, nothing can replace that analog sound for me on that particular path. Uh, Thiago also asks, do you have any advice on blending orchestral live stuff with sample libraries with different reverb sounds or ambiences? Uh, this is a big question beca uh, because sometimes nowadays people are used to the sound of the combination of samples and live. So in the beginning of a project, I sort of determine with the composer what the ratio is going to be between sampled orchestra and live orchestra. Maybe it's 100% live and we're not going to use any samples. Maybe it's 80% live with 20% samples just to help the, rhythm the rhythmic element stay together and then I'll try to keep the you know the that relationship relatively the same all the way through and sometimes it's the other way around where it's mostly going to be sampled and the live elements are there just to give it a little ambience and reverb and a little bit more depth and space. Okay from Peter Flaming he says what's your take on A to D and D to A conversions? 
Would you prefer going with the more expensive interfaces like Prism, or are you happy with the stock digit design HD IOs? In your experience, how much of a difference does it really make? Well, that's a really a 2014 question because, you know, in the old days, the, the upgraded converters really did make quite a bit of difference. But I think that DigiDesign has really made up the ground, and now I'm very happy with the DigiDesign I.O. The thing that I find m as important or more important than just the conversion is the clocking. You know, I've gone to antelope clocking, although, you know, all the clocks out there are wonderful. But in my experience recently, the antelope clocking has been, uh, uh, it's made a difference for me that everything just seems to be more solid and, um, and uh, more steady. So I think a combination of a good clock, whoever the manufacturer is, and a 192 is, is a pretty good sound. And, and uh, I've been happy with that. And I haven't used outboard converters in quite a while. And our final question from Samuel Laflamme. He says, hello, Alan. How would you describe your personal input or personal touch on a project? In other words, what is the main Alan Meyerson elements that make your sound and vision distinctive. Thanks. Well, first of all, thank you for feeling that way. I appreciate that. I, I take pride in my mixes, and um, I feel that um, my mixes are, you know, pretty aggressive, percussive. They they have a sense of being etched, where I, I like to really have the sense of of depth and dimension. Not that every mixer doesn't want the sense of depth and dimension. But I feel that maybe my approach gives me a certain style of that that might have a unique quality to it. And uh, the, I guess the main Alan Meyerson element may be not quite as ambient as other guys. I'm a, I'm a little dry. I like to keep things um, immediate. And, uh, and uh, I like to keep my percussion percussive and uh, I like to keep it moving. I, I really love the idea of having a line going through a piece of music that's constant, where it might be picked up by the cello and then the viola and then the guitar and, and whatever, is, whatever the line is, whatever that, that major thing going through a piece of music is, I wanna make sure that that's being uh, you know, heard and is up front. But I really do appreciate you feeling that there is an Alan Meyerson sound. And uh, thank you for the question. Thank you all for your questions. Um, and uh, I must say that this whole process of being here at um, La Fabrique, working with the mix with the masters guys, and this amazing bunch of people that I had this seminar with, these 15 people from 14 different countries, has just been fantastic. It's one of the, going to be one of my life's experiences that I'll never forget. Thank you very much, and uh, see you soon, hopefully in France.